All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another episode of Reactionary Opinions, the most based and reactionary show on the African continent. We must apologize for our delayed start, guys. Um, yes, Yanni, you have to love them technical issues, but it's all sorted out now, and um, hopefully we're going to have a really good technical issues free show tonight um to our listeners that have joined us thank you uh remember keep those um comments going in the comment section and hit a like on the video as well it brings people to our show thank you so much um everyone that's joined us anyway um we have some we have a very very interesting guest this evening the um one and only colonel uh chris wyatt now you know I stumbled upon Chris's show or Chris's channel uh, via friends of ours and stuff and uh, on, on Facebook and saw his stuff. And I thought, wow, okay, uh, retired colonel. I thought, well, okay, I enjoy everything military, so let me have a look at it. And, um, you know, it wasn't just the, the military thing that attracted me to Chris. It was his knowledge of Africa as a whole. I mean, this guy is just a wealth of knowledge. Of Africa, and you know he is. He made he made a comment once saying that um, if I wasn't if I wasn't American, I would be South African. So um, he's he's in my mind an actual. Now Dylan is an official African American, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. but <laughs> a real actual African American. So I thought I would tonight do something fun. And actually, don't don't let anyone ever tell you that if you come on reactionary opinions, we don't give you things. So I am going to off, I'm going to give Chris a an actual certificate um, of actual African American. So he is now a official <laughs> actual African American. Okay, and this has been issued by the. Actual African American South African Foundation of Actual African Americans who are African um, actual African Americans. So this is legit, Chris. So so it's 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 genuine. <laughs> this is the real the real deal. Okay, and then also something else that comes with this actual um, African uh, American certificate is something that you cannot be without. Um, as a actual African American is your official um, white privilege voucher. Um, this is valued Aww. at this is valued, Chris, at infinite white privilege, and it is also valued That's a lot of white privilege. Yeah, it is. you sure you want to give them all of it? What about us? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It is an infinite amount of white privilege, and it's valid until eternity. So you. Aww. That's something special for you. Um, and you might, on the on the actual uh, thumbnail for our video, uh, Chris is all in his uniform and everything. And a lot of people are like, this guy sitting in front of me now is not the same guy. Come on, that just can't <laughs> be the same guy. It's impossible, okay? So what I did is just to prove to you naysayers that uh, this is the actual same guy. I actually uh, photoshopped <laughs> the beard over the the, oh, the face wow. in his oh, in his dress uniform, and now you can see that this is the actual same guy. Uh, now, no now I have to say, in the photograph, I can see the the skin pigmentation difference. So you know, I had a tan that time. It was a summertime graduation ceremony last year, and clearly locked up under lockdown, trapped inside the pink. This has returned, and uh, I guess I get more white privilege now than I did last yes. summer. Yes, now you get the whitest of white privileges, okay? So consider yourself um, white privileged, um, Chris. <laughs> and, and you know, as South Africans, we have also – we're like the Colombians of white privilege. We have the best white privilege, okay? So um, anyway, a <laughs> little bit of a sidetrack over there, nice uh, little bit of a – way to start the show so don't ever say that when you come on reactionary opinions we don't give you things um we are very generous yeah <laughs> anyway um chris welcome to the show great to have you um uh how's it <laughs> okay guys it's my pleasure thanks a lot um it's uh what's become the kind of standard fare for me on fridays now it's a, it's a day full of youtube uh very busy either researching and writing things to prepare for prepared videos or doing live streams 
um, ever since I started my Stray Voltage live stream back in, I guess I really started Stray Voltage in May, but I started live streaming in April. But when I started Stray Voltage, just kind of, you know, give people something to watch in South Africa because, I mean, I don't know how many times you turn on MNUT before you want to swallow your 9 millimeter because it just gets old. So I started doing these streams, but uh, just Fridays have become kind of the chill thing. And I had um, Germ Warfare, Jeremy Nell was on my program just before this. And uh, then I'm on with you guys and then I'll do my night owl edition for those who are up later in South Africa and just kind of run through the news. So busy day from that standpoint. But how's it other than that? I am uh, <laughs> is hot full of this uh, nonsense with um, the lockdown the world over. I've, I've had my fill ich habe die Nase voll gehabt, as we say in German, and it's it's just uh, I just this this hysteria is driving me nuts. I know we're not talking about that today, but but you're asking how's it, and and I've, I'm beyond having my fill. People can't travel, they can't do things, and instead of protecting the vulnerable, we're just punishing the world. And so anyway, but beyond that, I'm doing well actually. Uh, kind of unhappy with the haircut. People say they like my haircut, but uh, I'm kind of missing my hippie hippie length hair that was here two days ago. So it's going to take me a whole year to grow it back. <laughs> the the beard, Chris, the beard reminds me of a guy, like a cartoon character um, in South Africa that we had when we were kids. And I'm kind of gr trying to grow, grow, grow that kind of beard, but you've pulled it off perfectly because yours is proper gray. Mine's just streaky gray. But you, your, your beard and, and everything and pretty much part of the haircut reminds me of uh, Davi Di Kaboter. It's a, it's a, it's a show. You'll... You, you, pe people in the comments section will probably know what we're talking about. I'm sure Yanni will know. Yanni and Tians, so they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But look it up after the show. You'll see Davi Di Kaboter. I'll, no, send, you, I, I'll I, send you a picture. I, I always thought that my beard reminded people of Pete Retief or perhaps even Delaray, General Delaray, but uh, who's Delaray? But anyway. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so Russell the Bass, how are you? No, I'm good, thanks. I'm uh, looking forward to a chat here with. Uh, with Chris tonight, I've uh, followed some of his stuff over the last, um, what, probably two or three months. And yeah, it's, uh, I've been quite impressed with his, as an American, his, his uh, insight into African affairs, it's been quite impressive. So I'm, uh, I'm just, it's an absolute privilege to be able to uh, have my own questions for him tonight. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, That's Mr. Awesome. Patriarch, how's it going there, brother? All doing good. Uh, just between being a, Working and being a patriarch and whatnot, I've uh, been plugging away at videos. And I've, for this past week, I'm I'm about five thousand words into my video on fascism. So that should be coming out hopefully on Sunday. But I don't know; it might might have to come out on Monday. So it's it ended up being a lot bigger than I thought it would be. But it's it's yeah. finally coming to an end, and now I'm just putting the finishing touches on it. D Dylan, yeah. I can help you with your book on fascism. We can just make a coffee table book <clears throat> with a couple of photographs and just put photographs of Antifa and Black Lives Matter on it, and you have your fascist. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> well, well, well uh, uh, Colonel, you, Dylan, Dylan likes to take sort of cursory looks at these sort of things. He is a historian, so he likes to you know dig deep into the, the, the history and that sort of thing. Some people might view his stuff as almost uh, controversially um, revisionist, I guess. No, not quite revisionist. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but it, it's, 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 um, it's rather reactionary. So anyway. Well, if you're looking for revisionist yeah. history, I suggest you go to Soweto to the, uh, uh, the Apartheid Museum, which has become the ANC Glorification Museum and not the history of the anti-apartheid <laughs> movement. Yeah, the that oh, is uh, the temple, the temple of um, an anti-apartheid or whatever, the temple of the ANC. I guess that's basically what it is. Yeah, it's it's Latuli House. <laughs> it's it's Tuli House Southwest. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, let's jump right into the show. Um, goodness me, we are so. For those of you that don't know, okay, those of you that are listening, uh, this guy below over here, Russell. Of a year, this guy with a bald head of a year. He and the beard is at, and the beard, red beard, not like my beard. But anyway, um, Russell is actually an esteemed Rhodesian. Yes, believe it or not, folks, Russell was born in Rhodesia. There is his ID book where you can see it clearly says country of birth, Rhodesia. Um, and there now you all know how old Russell really is. So anyway, <laughs> so um, Russell. Okay, hold, hold on, Scott. Sorry, sorry. Look, okay. In the interest of full disclosure here, 
being born in Rhodesia, Russell got in just under the wire, so he barely made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but I made it. <laughs> he did make it. <laughs> he pretty much got in right at the tail end and stuff. But anyway, um, yeah. Russell has a. I suppose you know my parents and stuff are Rhodesian. My dad is Rhodesian. Um, he's probably listening in the comments. Hi, Dad. Um, he is. So we were raised very much, I guess, uh, I guess culturally Rhodesian, um, if that means anything to anyone. But um, because of this upbringing and stuff and all these stories that we would hear from my dad and everything, Russell took a particularly keen interest in the history of Rhodesia and all of that. And um, I think, um, and, and not only the history of, of of Rhodesia, but a history of um, everywhere else, um, or, or Africa, specific so i think russell why don't you just sort of jump in and let us know you know with what what you want to talk to um to chris about yeah thanks scott generally chris the main what i'm trying to get to, to get your view on is um there is the popular culture view of the um, view of Rhodesia, the UDI Rhodesia from the 1960s through to 1980s as being this attempt at a ethno-white supremacist state in a corner of Africa, you know, and it's an oppressive to black majority and, and, and. That is the general consensus and narrative that you find in uh, uh, media circles. And I, if you you know, I've, I've read Ian Smith's books. I I've, I've understand I come from the same type of culture and background as uh, Ian Smith. Um, and that just wasn't his view. Um, the man was a, uh, actually, if you really, if you really want to describe him, that he's, he has this perception in the modern day era as a hard right, as a hard liner type of um white conservative right winger type of guy but the reality is he was actually a uh, english liberal um he was a somebody that uh, uh, saw himself as a and rhodesia his mission with rhodesia was to one day to maintain maintain standards for long enough to ingrain in the, to keep, to underpin a, 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 a type of new African uh, Christian society civilization. Um, and I would just like to hear your type of input of what you understand of that period and time. Yeah, no, uh, okay. So um, actually, uh, yeah, you probably talked about a series of books that his last really uh, tome was um, The Great Betrayal, which I have, I was trying to Pull it up here. My, my library is a mess after leaving my office, so I couldn't find it handy. But um, no, my view on Ian Smith and what was happening is that uh, I think people lose the historical context about what UDI was all about. Uh, there was already black nationalist movements underway that had started before UDI. And the, the, a big purpose of UDI was because the Rhodesians were tired of London ruling them and they were ready to move on. And that's what UDI was. And London was trying to dictate the terms and Rhodesians didn't want anything to do with that. Not all Rhodesians, but plenty of them. And they said, we don't want that. And that's the reason for the universal or you know, unilateral declaration of independence. Yeah. Universal would not have been cool. Unilateral declaration of independence. That's why they went forward. Um, and, um, but we have to be honest about two things here. I think that's important. Uh, when we talk about this intellectually, there were Rhodesians who were racist. There are some, there's racist everywhere and who couldn't cotton to the concept of having black political figures or having a majority government and wanted nothing to do with it. And those who believed that way, it wasn't a major number, but there were some, they glommed onto the Rhodesian front and supported that party because they saw that as their movement. And I don't think that was Ian Smith's movement. That's not the view I have of Ian Smith, but there were people. So every party has people like that. Every movement has people like that. Uh, and that became the narrative that was exposed. Well, the Rhodesians are all racist. They just want to implement apartheid. They'll never let black Africans have any say in the country. And this is what it's all about. That's why they broke away from the UK. I don't think that's an accurate narrative of what's happening. But part of this, and I think this is also part of intellectual honesty, and this is where my view on Ian Smith comes in. There is a degree, and, and I, we okay, it's easy, easy to 
comment and question on things that happened 60, 70 years ago because we're not in the circumstances of the time. And as a historian, I think I get very irritated when I hear people talk about, well, George Washington owned slaves. And what is your point? It's not germane to the conversation. All right. Now, did he was he out in the cornfields whipping slaves every day, you know, and raping women? No, he wasn't. So, OK, that doesn't make him a human evil human being. That was the times. And he didn't own slaves. He inherited through his wife anyway. But but to the situation with Ian Smith specifically, they think this is an accurate portrayal of it. There was a degree and this is pervasive throughout the Western European countries that had colonies in Africa, but kind of pervasive in the in the developed world, I should say. There's a degree of paternalism. That's involved here. Exactly. And I think. That, I think that uh, sorry, Chris. Yeah. Sorry, Chris. I just I, I, one of the things I forgot to mention was that um, Ian Smith clearly, and he, he's, his father, his father as well, and generally a lot of uh, Anglo whites in Africa had the had the doctrine of the uh, the um, white what they call the white man's burden. Yes. No, absolutely, and and I think that's the thing. Now today, in that context, that would be oh, that's racist. Oh, that's arrogant. Oh, that's white privilege. No, 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 ladies and gentlemen. That was a mindset at the time that grew out of decades of experience, good and bad. And it was, it was, it, 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 it wasn't racist in my view. It, it was probably bigoted because it was not an perhaps an honest view of Africans in general, but it wasn't evil. It wasn't, it wasn't malignant. And what I'm saying is that this degree of paternalism was persistent all over the place. You know, it's kind of like even right. today in the West, you know, we're going to go to Africa and we're going to make things better because we're going to give them money. We're going to build things for them. And the Chinese do the same thing. No, no, no. Okay. That's a paternalistic view as if you know better, these people are your charges. And what I will say about Ian Smith, when I've listened to his interviews, read his comments, heard his speeches, the things he's written, is there was a fair amount of paternalism in his worldview. But I will say that that even in that role, he felt it was his responsibility to help develop Zimbabwean black African communities so that they could become the power brokers and be part of this community. But in his view, if it were left, if the natural course of events under Ian Smith's worldview had happened, I think we wouldn't have got to the place where blacks reached equal political status until the 90s at the earliest, probably. I think that if, if that's a counterfactual, but if history had rolled out, that's what would have happened, I think. But eventually would have happened. Yeah, Chris, I, I, could, I agree 100 percent with you. Um, uh, the the idea that, that that idea of paternalism is a strongly held view, um, it, it's borne out. I know that it's a strongly um, uh, as, as doctrine almost uh, held by the likes of Ian Smith and his generation. And um, that was clearly, if you, if you draw a picture of Ian Smith's ideology, just Ian Smith himself, um, you would clearly see that that was the actual trajectory that he was looking at. People said, people said oh, he said, no, never, there'll never be uh, black rule. He didn't say that. He said there'll be no black nationalist rule in my lifetime. So he would have his 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 idea was that eventually, if you hold the line, if you hold the standards and underpin any everything for long enough, you can grow strong enough institutions and cultures around those institutions and uh, and actually um, reveal the fullness of the of a of an African. So I believe that Ian Smith would have been quite happy to um, go to the grave having the le his legacy being a country like Botswana. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I agree entirely with that. A, a, a legitimate democracy, multi-party elections in which violence is not part of it. And with black rule, it's fine. I mean, listen, whites live in Botswana with no problem whatsoever. I mean, nobody cares that they're white and nobody cares that people are black. And, and, and I, the problem is, as I said, is that, is that, People link things, they conflate things, and because there were, I mean, okay, so what I always tell people, and no one take offense if you're a Rhodesian here because it's not intended, but it's, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, but, but after 1980, the population, the white population of Rhodesia went from like 270, 290 down to about 125,000, uh, and then it, it kind of steadied there for a while, but a lot of people left, and, and people talk, and I'm giving the context of post-2000 now, okay, so that's an important figure, but post-2000, I hear people, and I'm in Africa, I'm traveling, I'm in Zimbabwe, I'm, I'm in Botswana, I'm traveling around Africa, and I hear people talk about, well, white, white, white Zimbabweans are, are racist. I'm like, okay, hang on a second. Okay, there's always racists somewhere. There's always people with a stupid mindset and think one group of people is better than another. So I won't dismiss that. I can find a racist anywhere if I look hard enough. Fortunately, there's not a lot of them. It's a small number in every group. But most of the racists, the people who couldn't stand black national rule in Rhodesia, 
left in 1980. They went to South Africa, those who actually were, because you still had apartheid in South Africa and there were close links between the two and you could move bank accounts and things like that. It was easy to do. So if there were people who were generally racist, they didn't stay in Zimbabwe for black nationalism. I mean, there might have been a few that hung out because they had a lot of property and a lot of wealth, but but the number was very tiny. And I think that that's the case with the number of people who were actually racist that would never want majority rule was actually small that supported the Rhodesian Front. But they're the ones who are vocal. Watch the interviews the show on Australian television and all these other programs the Brits would record. Like they go to this cricket club and the people are there for the cricket club. The blacks will never rule in this country. I have a lousy Rhodesian accent, so I'm not even going to try. The blacks will never rule in this country. No, we will never allow that. Never, never. God made this country and we, and, and, and that's what got the attention. So people assume that that's what Rhodesians were. No, that was that Rhodesian, but that wasn't Rhodesians. Yeah, uh, look, 100%. Uh, I think we, I think we're pretty much on the, on the, on the same sort of page. And um, um, I, it, it's just a, the Rhodesian question is a, is a um, interesting, it's always an interesting thing. Um, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of other things I want to discuss about it, uh, African affairs I want to discuss. I don't want to get too stuck on Rhodesia, but I, de I definitely wanted to get that um, view out of the way. So it looks like we're pretty much on par with uh, 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 thoughts regarding um, Ian Smith and the, generally the Rhodesian political situation and what it really was. Um, so, um, yeah, look, the other thing, um, there, were, there were, you know, maybe another time we can talk we can talk uh, uh, at another point about the, um, the 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 whole military side of it, which is very fascinating as well. But I think that's a very complex sort of thing, and it will take too long. But one of the things I would I, I would like to just close off uh, Rhodesia there, for an instance. That's the really one thing where I'm really happy. I feel so proud that uh, a knowledgeable man like you is uh, and myself are generally in agreement. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'd really like to find out about your experiences in Botswana. And, um, you know, what is uh, the, the, the general, if you could give a summarize of reason as to why Botswana has been a relatively successful African state? Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of reasons, but I'll try to do this in the, um, the condensed version, the Reader's Digest. Is that still around? Reader's Digest? But anyway, <laughs> Reader's Digest condensed <laughs> version. But, uh, I mean, that was a big part of growing up, the Reader's Digest. I couldn't wait to read that all the time. But anyway, um, so... One of the key reasons why Botswana is successful is that it was never colonized. Now, that doesn't mean a place that was colonized can't be successful. They can. But when I tell this to my, when I was at the war college teaching, Army War College, I would tell my students, I'd always ask them, I said, so what countries in Africa were never colonized? And invariably, the answer would be Liberia and Ethiopia, to which I say, you're wrong. And they're like, what? No, 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 they weren't colonized. Yes, Liberia was colonized. The fact that the people had brown and black skin doesn't mean it wasn't colonized. It was colonized by former slaves and free blacks from America who came back and then imposed an alien system of governance onto the indigenous peoples. That is colonization. And that's what happened. And then they ruled for 150 years that way and, and they discriminated against people. Anyway, so that, and then I say the other one, Ethiopia, it was colonized. From 1936 to 1941, it was occupied by the Italians, Addis Ababa and the Enverns around it. So the country was colonized. Emperor Haile Selassie fled the country. So if Ethiopia wasn't colonized, why did he flee the country? Well, anyway, but Ethiopians are very proud people. They have a long history and they don't like to hear that, but that's the truth. Botswana was never colonized because as the truck boars came up, moving into Angola, going through the Kalahari, many of them dying on the door, the Dorsland trekkers, the thirst trekkers, um, the, the, the Dikosi, the chiefs from the different Swana tribes in that area, like, well, wait a second. <laughs> Obviously, this is what they said. This is my paraphrase. But wait, wait a second. Uh, uh, I don't like this. This you know, we, these guys are coming through here. They're cattle herders, just like we are, or competing for our grazing rights. Um, we don't like this. So the Dikosi approached the British Empire and asked if they could give them protectorate status, to, in which would you know diminish the number of Afrikaners Boers coming into the country, which is what they did. And so Betjawana land became a protectorate. The reason that's important, the reason I told you all that, is because. As a consequence of that, the traditional leadership and political system largely stayed intact. It was not interfered with colonial authorities. And so that underpinned the development of the society and the continuation, the political development. So Botswana was pretty much unscathed by any external political influence, um, influences, but not actual systems applied until independence in 1966 when it was became a country. So that's one of the main reasons. The next reason why Botswana is different, so it was pretty much left to its own devices. And the Brits, of course, granted independence in 1966, and four months later, <laughs> they discovered the first diamond pipe. So their timing wasn't very good, but it was great for Botswana. 
So they, they, they inherited a country with 16 kilometers of coal tarred roads. So there's basically no roads in the country, no electricity for the mo electricity for the most part. The capital city of Habaroni had 5,000 residents and no reservoir for water, which it has now not enough, but anyway. And so the country was massively underdeveloped. Virtually everybody lived on, uh, uh, lived in poverty. There were only about 600,000 people in the country in 1966. Today it's a little over 2 million, about 2.1 million. If you throw in the illegal Zimbabweans that live there, it's about 2.4 million. <laughs> and then, um, so, so what happened is that they had an educated elite who did get education, like um, uh, Saretse Kama, who went to the UK, married an English woman, Ruth Williams, which also plays into this, and then had his kids, uh, Ian Kama and uh, Chitsiki and the others. But anyway, um, so they had an educated elite who learned Western liberalism and constitutional monarchies and learn different systems of governance. And they brought those ideas back to Botswana and they would come back to Botswana. And so they established not a constitutional monarchy, but a republic. And um, those things were a sound basis. The discovery of diamonds, which gave them revenue to develop the country, um, a history of non-interference and respect for traditional leaders. Now, the South Africa is different. South Africa has this, this cock system in which they've got, you know, they're paying traditional chiefs just to support a system. And basically it's handouts, you know, they have no real political yeah. power. It's ridiculous. It ought to be disbanded anyway. And if people want to be a traditional chief, then you're a traditional chief, but you have no political authority and you don't get money from the state. In Botswana, the traditional leaders still have a formal role. So you have the, you have the kotla in which people go to that. And if they have a dispute, they talk to the traditional chief and they say, listen, look, my neighbor, broke my fence and I lost three cows last night because of that. And they won't resolve this with me. We present our case to you, you would judge it. Now you can do that or you can go to a civil court. Both are appropriate. And if the if the chief and you're both members of that group, like say you're, you're the, the Bangmanwatos in the North, which is where Ian Kama is from, the Bangmanwato tribe. If you're a Bangmanwato and you take it to the to the, 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 the Kosi, the chief in the Khotla, then what now too much Setswana coming here. But uh, if you go there and make your dispute, you talk about it, it can be resolved there and people accept the judgment. And if you don't want to accept the judgment, you can go to civil court or you can go to civil court. So both mechanisms exist, but but the weight of the law is with the civil government, not with the traditional system. That's the one distinction. But both exist and both work. And I think those things in concert with some honest leadership, which is unusual. Now, but the, 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 the Botswana never had to fight for their independence. They already had it. It was just recognized fully in 1966 when they took over responsibility for their foreign affairs and international relations. And so they never had to fight for it. So they never developed this, this reactionary, revolutionary nonsense that you find in the Pan-African Congress, in the African National Congress, and things like that. So I think all of those things come together along with good fortune. Listen, the United States was founded because we were the luckiest people on the planet. You can never get so many forward thinking, wonderfully focused on freedom and democracy and liberty and human rights, people in one place at one time as we had in this country, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, George Watt, the list is endless. We could, I could run through the list of uh, John Hancock, of dozens, hundreds of patriots who had their heads screwed on straightly and came together at the right time, the right place in history. Uh, Botswana didn't have that many patriots, but it had enough people that came together at the right time and it got off to a good start. And having a good start was critical. Getting off to a good start is one of the reasons why Botswana is just why it's so successful. That said, there are challenges and people gloss over the challenges. They talk about it being uncorrupt. No, there's corruption in Botswana. But anyway. It's interesting. Thanks so much. Um, another interesting thing is um, you talk, you spoke about the, 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 the sort of influence of the traditional leaders still being able to resolve things that are sort of a grassroots sort of level, you know, um, and actually settle a lot of things amongst themselves. Um, I think one of the nice things about Botswana is that they're all part of the same ethno group, ethno linguistic group. Um, so it definitely does help with regards to, um, there's no, how can I put it? It's like you've got different clans, uh, different clans within the, 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 the broader as um, Setswana um, family, but um, they kind of uh, negotiate. They've been doing it all these years since protectorate days. They've been doing it. And they've been resolving these things for generations like this. So they, 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 there's no real um, kind of animosity. There, there's a history of um, negotiation, settling disputes through their usual way. What do you think about that? Well, um, not, not to contradict you, Russell, because you seem like a good oak. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let me just uh, let's say this. Okay. Uh, that is the narrative that a lot of people use to try to explain Botswana. But having lived there, I can tell you that 
Yes and no. Let me explain. Or as we say in German, yein. Ja and nein. Yein. So yein is the answer for that. Okay, specifically, what you're getting at is it's 85% of the population are um, first language Setswana speakers, which is Swan in South Africa. It's the same language. So 85% Setswana. So they go, oh, see, it's a, it's a, it's a homogenous society. That's why it's successful. Only I would argue it's not. There are great differences between uh, the Barang and the, the Bangamwatu and all the different groups who are Setswana. They have very... They have different political differences. So they may speak the same language, but they're different peoples, although from the same origin. But there's enough of a distinction. And those groups are also present, all of them, in South Africa. So there's there's also links across there. You have cousins across the border. And so so it's not as simple as everyone was was um, was homogenous. And also, the official language of the country is English, which um, they settled on, which made an impact. Now, about 8% of the population is white or European. I hate the use of European or white, but whatever. You know, pale pink folks like me and, and, and Russell. <laughs> and all, all of us, I guess we're all pink here. But anyway, so um, about 8%. And here's the thing. That 8% is influential. One of the reasons why that's the case is that early in the Republic, they made the decision that they were happy to invite or to keep uh, Europeans and whites who had the techno expertise until Botswana got the education and the experience to take over those roles. And that has continued to this day. Uh, most of the pilots in the tourism sector you found around the Okavango Delta, which is, by the way, it's the busiest airport in Botswana in normal times. More flights in and out of there than in Havarone because people come from all over Southern Africa to go there for tourism. Um, but the, most of the pilots are whites, Canadians, uh, Australians, uh, South Africans, Rhodesians, whoever, uh, we're all from all over the world. So that's an impact. And then also you have the Kalanga, the Kalanga from Zimbabwe, who came over and, and fled Zimbabwe and wound up in Botswana. You have the San, the Bushmen. Uh, it's one of the larger mm -hmm. populations of Bushmen in the world. Uh, they're part of the country. And you also have a, a population of colors, which most people don't know, South African Cape colors who are in Botswana and have been there for centuries. So it's a little more complex than just saying it's it's um, it's all one ethnic group because it's not. Now, I know someone will quibble with me and go, well, 85%. Yes, but if you break the 85% of Setswana speakers into their constituents, groups who have political differences, you find that no group has more than 20 or 25 percent ethnicity. And so I think it's much more diverse than people make it out to be. And, and that, that's kind of why I'm saying yine. So, okay. so, so it's kind of on, like uh, the United yeah. States and that said, so difference between like, you know, a Cajun and, you know, a Yankee. And that difference would have been a lot more uh, noticeable, you know, 150 years ago. So it sounds like so they're American and they all speak English but they're not exactly the same in the same way that like with Botswana, essentially with maybe even more. I think that's, uh, no, I think that's kind of a fair correlation. Um, and the distinction being there, put it in the American context and also the Botswana context, you, you might be, you know, uh, you might look like me and sound like me and speak the same language, but we're not the same people. We may have some of the same ideas, but we do have genuine political differences. I mean, Texas is very different than Maine politically, very different. And uh, the culture is different too. And as you mentioned, Acadians who wound up in Louisiana and that's, quite different altogether. But but the point is that, uh, and that's the situation in Botswana. So I think that's an important, important point you make there. Chris, are you, are you saying, are you saying that diversity is Botswana's strength? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me, let me, let me make a point here. First off, let me just dis dismiss this rumor. Okay. First off, um, it's the use of diversity is one of the most misused words in English language. I detest the political woke application of the term diversity because diversity in the context that most people who use it, corporate world, the government, it's okay, I have one of these and one of those. I got a black, I got a gay, I got an Asian, I got a mixed race, I got a transgender because you got to include that now too. I got one of everything. Okay, now we're diverse. Yet they're all right wing. They're all right wing conservatives who believe in the same thing. They're against abortion. They want low taxes. So how is that diverse? They're the same damn people. They just look different. What we look like, who we are, and who we identify matters not when it comes to diversity. But that is what people do. In my career in the army, thirty six years, I don't think I ever came across a single equal opportunity NCO, non commissioned officer, who wasn't white or was not black or female. Uh, they're either female or they're black. Never a white guy. And so I can't know about equal opportunity. I can't empathize and understand about how our responsibility is. That's just stupidity in my book. Anybody can. And so 
That is not true diversity. Diversity to me is diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, diversity of experience. Now, your experience might be as a consequence of your physical appearance because of culture you grew up in, but simply going, ah, I've got the Zulu, I've got the Venda, I've got the Twana, I've got the Afrikaner, I've got the gay, I've got the Muslim. That's BS. And I didn't use the profanity because I'm assuming it's, a, it's an adult, it's a child program. Anyway, so no, I, I hate that. That word is so misused. But yeah, but back to your point, yes, Botswana is diverse. So and, and and people are like no they're all they're all they're all Setswana speakers yes but they're very diverse Setswana speakers and that's the bottom line. What is Chris? What do you think? Having having lived in Botswana and stuff, you know, I I have a lot of mates of mine that are like, you know what, all this nonsense that's going on in South Africa, I'm going to pack my bags, sell everything I have, and move to bloody Botswana, you know. And um, I, I I just want to know, like, sure they they they're vastly diverse, but is there some sort of are they moving as a country towards, you know, the same goal? Is it, um, what, what is their, do they share the same sort of ultimate goal? Because I don't believe that you can, as a country, you know, succeed when everyone's sort of clashing against each other and moving in different directions. There has to be some sort of um, united front as a country instead of, uh, you know, moving all sort of against each other and, and, and all of that. Why, why do you think... How do you think they're managing to do that as a diverse country? Well, um, one of the things, and I, and I really hate these sorts of things because it's like communist, you know, central planning nonsense. But Botswana has a national development plan. Um, I, I just don't like the concept. I no objections to their plan. I mean, it's, it's sound. I appreciate strategic planning, but I just it's like you know, in South Africa, our cadres. No, that's freaking socialism. That's communism. That's the Soviet Union. But anyway, but back they have national development plans. They have five year plans. They have multiple ones. So the, the, the government uh, strategically is moving in the same direction. It's about development. It's about uh, lifting people out of poverty. But as I mentioned, Botswana does have problems. About 42% of the population still lives on less than $2.60 a day, which most people don't know because Botswana is a middle income country with a per capita income. I'd have to look. It's probably around eleven or $13,000 per year, which is pretty significant in Africa. Um, but but um, I think that um, – that, um, Sorry, senior moment there. I was answering your question. Please give me your question again, Scott. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I, 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 I'm just trying to figure out how they're managing to succeed and thrive when they're so diverse. And, you know, oh, okay. it, it's, it's, it's one okay, thing. Yeah, like, yeah. There's, yeah, there's, sorry, there's, there's, I got it back. The, 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 the neurons have fired again. Neurons. So um, the, uh, they do have a common purpose politically. Now there are differences, and and the thing is, is that um, because it's been a largely honest government with low corruption and there's been there has been growth you know here's the thing yugoslavia didn't fall apart because they had differences yugoslavia fell apart because the economic model failed and people weren't growing and when and when, ec when economies fail then people notice political social facial religious differences and they get accentuated because the other is to blame the other got something i didn't get it well that's never really been the case in botswana in its its free independent history is that it isn't like somebody didn't prosper because someone else got something the pie is continually grown for all and i think that's a big key for why botswana has succeeded now they have run into periods in which things have gone sideways the 2008 financial crisis was devastating for botswana but fortunately for them despite the myths about ian Kama as a dictator and he runs like a general and oh, despite all that nonsense and i live there it was bs that's not true the only thing i can say about ian comma that is negative it's not really negative is every time i listen to him i want to chuckle because he sounds like a 12 year old english schoolboy with his accent uh but um, <laughs> i'm just saying he sounds like a 12 year old schoolboy because he grew up in england you know he's got that voice and and you see this face you look at this guy he looks impressive and then he's like hello chaps how are you all doing today can i have some more soup sir and he just kind of throws you for a loop but but no, um, but Ian Kama's government will never get the recognition they deserve. I was there. When the 2008 financial crisis hit, Botswana still got three quarters of its government's revenue from mining. And two thirds of that came from diamonds specifically. Guess what? From one month to the next, next the demand for diamonds around the world, particularly in China, which was buying a lot of diamonds because all these rich Chinese criminals, you know, Ooh, look at my camera. Anyway, so they stopped buying diamonds. So what did they do? The government, unlike my government, which kept spending and expanding, their government said, you know what? We can't afford to do capital projects. So the, the staff college for the military was put on hiatus. They stopped planning for it. I mean, they still built the plan, but they stopped the funding, which was supposed to be that year. So we're not going to build this until we have money. We have to wait. They retrenched 5,000 government workers. That's a lot of people in Botswana. They got but unemployment. 
It is, but 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 they retrenched them. Instead of growing the size of government, they they temporarily reduced it. And when the revenue returned, they brought them back. Additionally, Botswana had something like three point four billion dollars in hard currency reserves sitting in banks, dollars and pounds. And instead of drawing that money down, because that's for a really rainy day, they said, let's approach the international financial institutions and try to get a loan. And because of their sterling credit record, they got a favorable loan on great terms, I think from the African Development Bank for like, uh, I forget the amount, just don't hold me to it, but like 1.2 billion or 2 billion, something like that. They borrowed the money and they used that to cover the revenue shortfalls in the national budget. They had sound macroeconomic measures and it's they survived it. Now they're also going through a trouble now, but the leadership now needs to, it needs, it needs to be given some drugs because clearly he's losing his mind. Uh, I have issues with the current president of Botswana. Um, he's, he's lost the plot. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure how Botswana is going to do in this situation, but historically they've had good strategic vision and that's played a big role in why they've been successful. Fascinating. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's very, very interesting. Thanks so much, Chris. I mean, that's, that's incredible insight stuff that I, that I, um, you, you, because in South Africa, we, we don't hear, actually, it's our neighbor, but we don't hear much about Botswana. We, we try and figure out what's going on there through bits and pieces. Um, recently, we had a, a, a situation with the um, a foreign dip, a diplomacy issue recently with... Um, Brid Bridget Motsepe. Yes, yes, yes. And it, basically, the media tried to make it sound like these guys were trying to, do a, to operate some sort of regime change or coup in Botswana. Yeah, but, but that's that stems not from South Africa. There is a connection there. And what's happening is that Bridget Motsepe has a relationship with Ian Kama, if I'm not mistaken. And wh what's happened here, and this is one of the reasons I talk about the plot being lost. Now, in interest of full disclosure, I'm a fan of Ian Kama. He's not a perfect human being. He's made mistakes. And we all do. But but as far as President of Botswana, I, I think he did a brilliant job in a very difficult time, especially with the attacks he was getting. Now, he was stern within his political party, the BDP. But that's the reason he got this reputation to people who are malcontents in his party because of his stern political leadership inside the party, but not inside the country and government. They didn't like it. And so they went to the press. Oh, he's a dictator. Oh, and like little whiny 12 year olds. And so he got this because the press is all too willing to run stories. And so they 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 um, that kind of got that kind of got where it's got. So when. The thing is, here the BDP has been clever. They've been the only political party to ever rule the country since independence. Now, people say that's bad for democracy. It can be, and I think that it's time for a new political party to step to the front, and I hope it happened this last election. But because if, if you stay in power forever, you get too comfortable, and then people get lazy, and corruption seeps in, and people start, you know, and, and that's a problem. Anyway, look at the ANC. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, um, so what happened with the BDP is that Historically, what they've done is that in order to ensure that they win the next election and they keep continuity, the last year of a president's term, typically the BDP president will resign from office. And then their vice president by law becomes the president. And then what happens is that president, the new president, gets a whole year to continue the momentum and also to take policy positions, have a plan. It's clever politically, but it works. And so Ian Kama became president a year before his predecessor was supposed to leave office. He became president, right? And that was, uh, what's his name? The uh, Mo Ibrahim Prize winner there. I can't think of his name right now. But anyway, uh, he replaced him. And um, then Ian Common became president a year before he was elected. Then he got elected to the office and selected for president. And so when Kama was leaving, he picked Masisi, Eric Masisi, to be his successor. They both served in the Botswana Defense Force. They've both been long in the BDP. And uh, he was his vice president. So he said, okay, I'm resigning. You're the president. And then as soon as he left office, Masisi started all this nonsense and talking about Kama and doing things. And, and Kama would say something publicly and he'd be attacked by Masisi. And, and Kama started striking back. And most embarrassingly for Botswana, we suddenly had this nonsense in which the two, the former president and the current president were arguing about everything. It was playing out in the press every day. I'm like, knock it off. You look like a bunch of idiotic school children having a fight in the playground. And this is bad for Botswana's reputation. Well, that turned into a claimed coup attempt that Kama, who now was the first president ever in the history of Botswana to leave his party and back another political party. He did that for the last election, which is sacrilege. Oh, <gasps> and it was all because of this, this beef with Masisi. So he leaves the party and um, then this whole thing gets cooked up. I've seen no evidence of it. Maybe there's evidence, but this whole thing gets cooked up that Kama is behind a coup attempt. They're trying to undermine the elections. And then that's how uh, Bridget Motsepe got drawn into this. And it's just, it's, it's, it beggars the imagination. Supposedly, they stole something like $10 billion or $100 billion. If that kind of money disappeared from Botswana's banks, everybody would notice. It's a tiny country of 2 million people, and only about 800,000 of those people have any money at all. So it's just ludicrous.
That was just an interesting media matter that had come up that I just thought you might have insight in as well, you know. So yeah, that's the. But that's interesting. That's very, very interesting. You, 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 you kind of, um, you know. And then the, the is it the Botswana government that has hired um, Harry Nell now or something to, to do a case or something? Yes, that's Eric Masisi's government. They've hired um, Afroforum's uh, advocate uh, Harry Nell to be uh, represent them in this case against Bridget Mosepe, and they're trying to recoup money, take you know, supposedly transferred to banks in South Africa and so forth. Uh, and that's what it's all about. Um, I, I I don't know if money was transferred out or what's going on, but but I find it implausible that Ian Kama, who is a consummate professional military officer, who is wildly opposed to interference by the military and served as an honest, legitimate president when he could have pilfered billions and nobody would have noticed. I mean, think about this: when the economy nosedived in two thousand eight, if that guy was a crook, if if he wanted power, he could have he could have gotten dictatorial powers pushed through the parliament and done what he wanted. He could have pilfered billions of dollars, and that never happened. But so I don't I, I don't I don't hold a lot. Of, I mean, I could be wrong. We'll see. But I don't hold a lot of faith in this whole story that, that there was an outside effort to collude with Kama and this new political party to undermine, overthrow the government. We're talking about a coup attempt, but it's not a coup attempt. It was election interference, which in itself is a crime, but it's not a coup attempt. A coup attempt mm. is the Wonga coup plot. Guys get on a plane, they fly in, and they try to take over government, either by force or by just forcing somebody to resign. This is not what happened in Botswana. What happened in Botswana is they're claiming that money was used to undermine the election. This is like the freaking Democrats in America with their Russian, you know, the <laughs> Russians, the Russians undermining. Oh, they, they spent $50,000 buying Facebook. Listen, if you go to Facebook for your advice on who you should vote for, then you shouldn't have the right and privilege to vote because you're a moron. Yay, that's that's yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, Chris, um, I want I want to just sort of before uh, Dylan, I want to hand over to you as well to bring us some sort of questions or American stuff that that you might have for uh, Chris. But uh, before I get into that, I just want to get into the comments sections and say how's it to uh, some of our regular watchers. Dag Breker, he's probably also always on your show as well, Chris. I often see him there. Um, Where's Yanni? Old Yanni is here as well. Yanni is here. Um, Tians, welcome, welcome back again. Um, and here we go. Here we go. Where is he? Uh, here we go. Uh, Tyrone Stevens almost missed it. You're lucky you didn't. Otherwise, there would have been trouble, my friend. Uh, there we go. There's Robin McLaren. There's my pa. He says, hey, Chris, nice to see you on the show. Hey, pa. He's one of your biggest fans, Chris. Um, Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I appreciate so, it. So all of our listeners, all of our regular listeners, those that I haven't got around to, hey, Petsu, uh, the Petsu film crew, how's it going? Um, he's he, he or she, I don't know who it is, is always commenting about how my camera is set up, which is uh, quite interesting, always doing that. Um, Dag Breker has a question over here. Um, uh, which we'll get to just after Mr. Patriarch has mentioned something. Sorry, Dylan, we you, you're like in the corner of the show tonight, so go, go on, let's, let's hear some oh, good, man. talking. No, no, don't worry, don't worry about me. We're, we're here to hear, hear what Chris has got to say. So, um, I'm just uh, I, I just got a couple of questions about Africa specifically. Um, one of them has to do with, um, and you seem like obviously the guy to ask about this, uh, what sort of Africa's role globally speaking? So geopolitically, sort of what's going on with, I know um, one guy I've talked, or um, I haven't talked to, but one guy I've sort of read and sort of seen lectures by myself is this American geopolitical strategist, uh, Peter Zihan. And one of his things is that, um, so China... And it, he, he's mostly focusing on Asia, but the Chinese uh, basically rely on the current world order as it exists, uh, free flow of trade and goods in order to basically grow themselves to what they are now. They're sort of one of the main benefactors of the current system after Bretton Woods. Um, however, as tensions continue to maybe cool down a little bit between the U.S. and China, that obviously puts strain on potential trade relations and as a result, China may, you know, be facing a, 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 a deficit of sorts, as it were, in their standard of living. 
And one of the things that the Chinese have been very keen on is this uh, Belt and Road Initiative going uh, to the West um, across uh, the Indian subcontinent, essentially, and then also looking to get some of their resources from uh, African countries. So what is your sort of position? What sort of insights do you have as far as where does Africa stand geopolitically vis-a-vis other countries? And what, if any, uh, shenanigans are going on from various foreign countries in the African continent? Okay. Um, yeah, there's a couple of really good questions there. First off, and not meant as an insult to everyone in Africa, and for those who know me, know that I'm a huge fan of Africa, obviously. Uh, Chris White, Africa is my channel, and <laughs> I spent a good part of the last 20 years living in Africa and researching and writing it, and been following Africa since 1979, thereabouts. Um, so uh, the bottom line is this, and really, uh, please uh, don't let egos be bruised, but Africa doesn't matter. The world doesn't care about Africa. It's a rounding figure. Yeah. Uh, I just double check. Let me explain this and put this in perspective for people. But everybody's like, well, we need South Africa. We, you need the platinum. You need the cobalt from the Congo. No, we don't. There's alternatives. We don't need that. You need the oil. We don't need oil. We're not buying oil from Africa. That's one reason why Africa's economy slumped, because we stopped buying oil from Africa. Others need it. China needs it. Um, but even China can get many things elsewhere. But let me put this in perspective. Africa's total GDP is something in the order of $1.3 trillion or something like that. I'll have to double check on the figure. Um, let me help you out here, folks. California has 36 million people. Its economy is $3.2 trillion. It's three times the size of the entire continent of Africa with 1.3 billion people. Now, get, wrap your head around that, okay? So that's California, okay? We could take Texas. We can take New York. We could throw them in there. I'm sorry, Africa doesn't matter. It doesn't. Now, people, so Africans, especially black nationalists, whoa, you racist, you're arrogant. No. Okay, now, don't, don't, don't <laughs> I attach, agree with you, Chris, it doesn't right, matter. Don't attach moral valuation to that. I didn't say Africa is, is a place full of nasty people in a horrible place and nobody should care about. It. That's a moral valuation. I'm not putting a moral equivalency or valuation on it. What I'm suggesting to you is that geostrategically, it's a blip. No, we don't need to go around Africa. We can go to the Suez Canal. If the Suez Canal disappears, then we'll go different routes. We don't need Africa, the world. The world doesn't need Africa and doesn't need Africa's problems. That said, Africa is the great bonanza. It's the next El Dorado. The great opportunities in the 21st century beyond 2030 are going to be in Africa, not in China. China's already, you know, they're festering. They've got so many problems. And the Wuhan coronavirus, or as Trump likes to call it, the China flu, has put the nail, one of the nails in their coffin. And, and everyone's like, China's got the event. No, they don't. No, they don't. I can't find a DVR, a DVD, a Blu-ray player in any store here. Why? Because we offshored all production to China and we're not making them in the United States anymore. And China can't make them because their factories are shut down because of their mismanagement of this crisis. And so they are going to lose customer base, just like South Africa is losing customers for its wine because of their stupid rules. And now so I, I can't get South African wine. The, the, there's only like one bottle left, one type over here, because we used to have a shelf full, but because they stopped shipping it. So my point is that Africa, in the grand scheme of things, folks, sorry, it doesn't matter. And people think, oh, no, you got nothing in Africa that the world has to have. Nothing. And here's the thing. If you think it's a commodity that the world has to have, coffee, well, we can get coffee from Indonesia. We can get coffee from Latin America. We don't have to get it from Africa. We just change blends. If you think it's a commodity like like um, what's the stuff in cell phones that people are always talking about there? I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. But but uh, I'll just say cobalt. It's not cobalt. But, but you're, you need cobalt. Well, you know what? The Chinese played this game by buying up all the rare earth element mines around the world. By the way, rare earths are not rare. It's just low concentrations. That's why they're called rare. There's actually tons of rare earths all over the planet, but you have to dig up mountains and destroy mountains to get to them. Hence the term rare earths. Anyway, so the Chinese bought up all, because they don't mind tearing down mountains. They're all into ecological destruction. They bought up all the companies that had these mines around the world and owned 99% of production because we shut down our California fact or mine because of environmental regulations, and then we no longer produce them ourselves. So China owned 99%. They had a dispute with Japan over these stupid little islands off the coast of Japan, and no offense to Japanese, but there's nothing there except bird droppings, okay? So uh, Japan claimed the islands. And the Chinese wanted it, and they had a dispute. They ran into a, a fishing vessel there. I think the Japanese Navy hit a Chinese fishing vessel, and escalations went up, or, or you know, tensions escalated. So what happens? China decides, aha, we're going to use our geostrategic influence to get the Japanese to back off and give us these islands. So they cut off rare earth element shipments to Japan since they controlled them all. Well, that was a crisis for Toyota and for all these companies who were making electric-powered cars because rare earth elements are necessary for the making of those cars. Japanese were in trouble. Their economy was in real serious trouble. 
And then four months later, Japan came up with an alternative. And now they no longer buy those rare earths. So now China is stuck not being able to sell it. So anyway, um, Africa, you think you got us by the tail. You don't. Um, let's work together and everybody can prosper. So that's the first thing with China. Um, and then the uh, you know, other question was about or, or how much does Africa matter? Sorry. The next thing was about China and you talk about the Belt and Road Initiative. Listen, the Belt and Road Initiative is the brilliant, brilliant, the most brilliant swindle and scheme of the 21st century. Well, let me explain to you why. China has hoodwinked the world and convinced the world that it's going to help the world. How? Because it's going to build a road, port, and airport network and rail network throughout Central Asia into the Indian subcontinent, into Iran, the Middle East, and all the way to Africa for the good of the world and to help out these poor Iranians and these Kyrgyzstanis and all these other people help their development. But guess what? The Chinese are lending the money for the construction projects. Those people are on the hook for the bill to make the infrastructure. And then China's going to sit back and use it as a conduit to ship all its crappy consumer products around the world. Brilliant swindle. Well done, China. Love your plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, look at for that input. That was a, uh... That was uh, that was mind-numbing nice. input. But one of the one of the one of the problems in Africa is that uh, what you're saying about um, in Africa they think um, for some reason in Africa they think economic welfare is directly attributable to commodities, which is a complete joke. You know, um, it's not um, economic. Pro they they kind of they in Afri for for some reason in Africa, if you've got po commodities equals wealth, then that's simply not true. You know, um, well, it's, okay, sorry, sorry to cut you, Russell, but it's just like the moronic stupidity of the African National Congress. Did I say that out loud? Yes, I did. Let me explain. While the rest of the world reduces its population working in agriculture because agriculture is not the way to increase wealth. You can make money in agriculture, but the United States once had 85% of its population, which was agrarian. We all worked on farms, small farms, tilling the soil with low productivity. But in the 21st century, less than 2% of our population is engaged in agriculture. You're not making money there. You're making it coming up with software like StreamYards and computers and technology and pharmaceuticals and intellectual capacity and human capital. That's where the wealth is, but you have to have an educated workforce, which is something the ANC refuses to have. And so that's the problem. So um, it's the same right. thing. You know, people people have their mind thought I'm going to make money. now you can make money I mean I'm not saying don't invest in you know in um, Rio Tinto it's a mining company people need raw materials but the people that make the money aren't the ones selling the oil they aren't the ones are mining the oil they aren't the ones digging up the cobalt or the copper yes they make money the people making the money are higher up the value chain Apple gets thousands of dollars for their fr crappy freaking iPhones and guess what designing <laughs> design in California where they pay people a fortune in salaries for the human capital to come up with the concept the operating system and the design of it they pay them a fortune and then built in China by essentially slave labor making no money per hour because it's a commodity and that's where the value chain is. And so I hear the story all the time with Ghana and Ivory Coast. Oh, well, we, the neocolonialism keeps us from making money because cocoa, the price is going up. It's a commodity. If people want it, the price goes up. If people don't want it, the price goes down. You want to make money? Start making chocolate that people want to buy. Use good marketing like Toblerone or Ritter Sport or Hershey or Nestle. And then people buy it. That's where the value chain is. And Africans have to get out of this commodity and agriculture. But back to the ANC. The ANC's plan is to steal everybody's land, which was lawfully obtained, steal everybody's land and hand over to a select group of people who will vote for them. Uh, people with, if, if you're black and you're not supporting ANC, you're not going to get land if there's expropriation. I guarantee it. So they're, we want, unless they think they can convert your vote, they're going to give land over and their mission is to put 1 million people into farming. That's moronic. How about putting 1 million people into software creation, into IT, into the medical field, into science, into astronomy? That's where the money is made. Become the suppliers of rockets to NASA. Why not? We'll buy rockets from South Africa. You just need to have people that get a matrix score higher than 30% in maths before we consider that. <laughs> yeah, rocket scientists. Yeah, not with our math smarts in South Africa. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at a rocket built. I'm looking at a rocket built by you know. Remember, science must fall because it's Western. It's evil. So I'm waiting for the science must fall on the traditional African science to build a rocket, which I can watch explode on liftoff. Yes, but Chris Wyatt, <laughs> don't you know that we currently own the greatest rocket scientist man on Earth at this current point now? He is South African. No, he's not. He's just that's no. Just listen, look, Ian yeah. Musk. Ian Musk is a visionary. He's a smart guy. He's a good business guy. He knows how to take advantage of government subsidies for like his batteries for his overpriced Teslas. His he's, a, he's, 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 a, he's, a, he's an American tenderpreneur. <laughs> 
Well, in that respect, he is. But he did he did create PayPal, which is brilliant, you know, and it undermined a lot of things in the, in, the, in that marketplace. But uh, Elon Musk, I have respect for everything except his zalling on on the radio. That was kind of irritated me. That's not a good example for kids. But but he is. But he's not a rocket guy. He just loves that stuff. But he is not a rocket scientist. But he hires the best talent. And unfortunately, it's not coming from South Africa. And South Africa doesn't have an open business climate like America does. And that's why he is in America. There you go. Yeah. So the only reason the idea is that, you know, there's this there's this bizarre idea going around, uh, floating around about the with these, you know, individualist oaks and stuff that that believe that that individuals are or that you can be an individual and and it was Elon Musk that sent those rockets into space. Forget about the forget about NASA, forget about the government, forget about all the engineers and scientists that work on it. It was Elon Musk that did it and it wasn't. He's just a good businessman who <laughs> knew how to pull the right strings and you know get the right people in the right place and that sort of thing. And that's all he did really. I mean well it's interesting. It's because you know it's it's uh people think that uh, Bill Gates is a brilliant programmer. He's not. He was smart for his time and his age 40 years ago, but he's a brilliant monopolistic businessman who now who knows how to exploit the rules that exist in the existing system, which allowed him to amass massive wealth and then walk around like he's some great humanitarian. Uh, you probably know how I feel about Bill Gates based on that. But back to um, back to Dylan's question um, about China. You made a statement, a, a statement or question, I'm not sure, about China being a primary beneficiary of the Bretton Woods system. I would say that from the creation of the Bretton Woods system in 1944 until 2000, the single greatest beneficiary of the system, if you looked at a country, would have been the United States. The system suited us, but but we weren't alone. It wasn't like the whole, the tide rise, it lifted all ships who were running with a similar system. So we benefited. But since 2000, because of its exploitation of World Trade Organization rules and its disregard for Ooh. the rule of law, China has been the actor that has benefited. Look, their economy is $1.8 trillion or $1.3 trillion in 2000. Today, it's $14 trillion in, in same in inflation adjusted dollars. They have benefited immensely by cheating within the system, so they've profited from it. China doesn't spend billions of dollars patrolling the South China Seas and the, and the, uh, the, uh, the Straits of Malacca. We do with the 7th and 8th fleets. That's who does it. We are like the British Imperial Navy of the 17th and 18th centuries. We are patrolling the lines of communication to the world's benefit. And I think it's time we start charging attacks, just like pirates. You want to pass through the Straits of Malacca? You need to stop and pay the U.S. vessels. Pull out your credit card. There's $100,000 for passage because we've just assured the pirates aren't going to steal your ship. I'm just saying, you know, I'm going to fix our your fiscal house, take care of the deficit here. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's spot that's, on, spot on. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you on that one. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's some. Um, okay, so so Chris, you know, um, you know, my myself, I I've spent a, a lot of time in the in the U.S. and and all of that. Dylan's American, and I was actually in the U.S. in last year, April, mm-hmm. last year April, I think, for a wedding and stuff, and. You know, American, I want to talk a little bit about Americans now and stuff because, you know, we've spoken a lot about Africa and Africans. E- easy and easy now. Don't be talking about America because you're going to get a thin ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't be talking to an army guy about, about America. And, uh, I know where the talk. weapons are hidden. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'll just I'll just show you and our viewers over here as I just sort of pan this around over here. Uh, my... Uh, my flag over there, my Gadsden flag over there in my in my bri room. Anyway, um, but you know, I I have a lot of American friends and stuff, and you know, I talk to a lot of um, South Africans about this, and it's interesting what you say about um, Africa as a continent, and that Americans and the rest of the world don't really care much for Africa. You know, um, it's it's well, they, they um, just they don't know about Africa. It's not not caring about it. it's it's well, Africa. I mean. Africa is still the dark continent in most of the world. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the whole point is that you know, I have I have friends of mine, incredibly smart people in the U.S., like really intelligent people, such as yourself, you know. And I I would go out and say like the the the, the American way of 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 thinking is a sort of curious mind. Like Americans have very curious minds. They. They're interested in things, you know. This idea that Americans hate hate immigrants and stuff is all a is all nonsense, you know. Absolute rubbish. Um, Americans love foreigners. They absolutely love them. They're they're 
they they um they're, they they're curious about foreigners and they ask all these great questions but you know it, whenever someone says to me they say to me well you know americans can't tell me where cape town is or americans don't know where lesotho is or they've never even heard of south africa they say uh you know you're from south africa why are you white kind of thing and i'm like well americans don't need to they don't need to know these things you know why do they need to know these things they they live in a no. country yeah they live in a country where they have everything they've got everything and more okay and and it, I, I always say to them i say to them listen oaks if you if south africa was america you wouldn't know america like that's that's the the point is is that you don't have to know these things but but i do think that there is a a a similarity between south africans and americans like the particularly the sort of boer uh, Anglo agrarian types and stuff like like myself and and Russell, the sort of frontier people and stuff, and I think that 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 still pervades in in American culture today. Um, obviously, not in places like California and stuff, but you know the the the, the general good the heartland. <laughs> yeah, the heartland. You know the the actual the actual the, what I call real America, um, and it it pervades in in that. What what are your thoughts on that, uh, Chris? Well, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff. We'll get back to the first point you had there and then make sure I capture all the points. You were talking about this myth, uh, even here in America, which is perpetuated by the left and the media, about even Donald Trump. Donald Trump hates immigrants. So the, the problem with that story is that is that the number of naturalizations, we naturalize one million people per, one million people per, half the population plus one become American citizens every year. And oh, by the way, Donald Trump has been president for nearly four years. And the three years that have happened while he's president, the numbers are almost unchanged from when Obama was president. So if Donald Trump wanted to stop that, he could have put an executive order to cease all naturalizations. And there would have been an uproar, but he could have done it. So it's just nonsense. Americans are naturally curious. We've grown because of immigration over the years, and they're not opposed to it. Um, so that that's a myth. That really drives me nuts. Uh, what was the second point there? Sorry, I want to make sure I got that out. No, just basically the um, similarities between Americans and, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. and South Africans. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, well, specifically about the Afrikaners or Boer South Africans, but all South Africans in general, but certainly that group, Americans have a similar history, historical trajectory, which uh, a lot of people overlook. And so what, what I'm talking about is that Americans have always had this, uh, this unbridled sense of enthusiasm, of adventure, of exploration, of pushing the boundaries and going further and further and further. And this manifested in the 19th century under this concept that was promoted by, by um, journalists and, and editors and newspapers like Horace Greeley, who talked about manifest destiny. Our manifest destiny is to expand this country from the eastern seaboard to the west coast and everything in between to absorb and become part of America and settle it. And, and that unbridled enthusiasm was, was attached to that was exploration, people picking up stakes and moving away from central authority to a place where they had control of their own lives. And it had a culture of faith and religion and God and country and also respect for family, as well as um, a culture tied to independence and guns. Guns were part of, you know, being armed because, I mean, you, you didn't live in Ohio country and decide to move to Oregon without having a rifle or, or you know, a gun of some sort, because along the way you were attacked by people who didn't want you there, Native Americans and, and brigands and others who didn't want you. So you had to stand up for yourself. And so we developed this independent streak and this natural curiosity has always been there. I mean, Americans are oftentimes seen as, you know, way too forward. I mean, Ameri they have the audacity to, I mean, Germans are like, what do, you, what do you mean you're asking if I'm married or who my family is or how my family is? That's none of your business. You know, you'll do that. But that's just the nature of Americans. You know, hello, how are you? What's up? You know, I, I grew up when you ride down the road, you wave to people, right? You drive past someone, you say, hey, what's up? People think that's crazy, but that's that's a very much, that's not strictly an American thing, but it's an American no, thing. It's not, we're not the only ones. Kind but of it. I still do it. I mean, I drive, I don't do it to everyone because there's thousands of cars, but if I'm on a road where there's almost nobody on, you know, I'm driving along and I see someone, hey, when I see police officers all the time, I always out of respect, I wave to them. I mean, they'll get you shot in some countries pointing to a police officer. No, I mean, that's just the nature of, of Americans. And I think that um, it, 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 here's the other thing about Americans too. Now, this is different than South Africa. Um, Americans, being an American is not being black, it's not being white, it's not being Asian, Christian, Muslim, Jewish. Yes, historically, we've been an overwhelmingly 
white Anglo-Saxon origin country. But that began to change in the late 19th century when massive numbers of Eastern Europeans started coming to this country and changing the dynamic, the racial makeup, or the ethnic makeup, I should say. So we're still a overwhelmingly white country. 73% of the country is white. If you include Hispanics who consider themselves white, it's 78%. So almost eight out of 10 people are white in this country, uh, despite what you hear. You know, we mentioned earlier, I think it was on this stream, or maybe it was with, I was, no, I was talking to Jeremy Nell earlier. He said something about the NBA, and he said, yeah. And I said, yeah, 78% of the NBA is, is black, whereas 13% of the population is black. <laughs> I guess the NBA is lucky we don't have broad based economic empowerment policies in play here. They'd have to, anyway. But, um, <laughs> But the similarity between America is that we also have we also have some of the historical baggage. We do have a history of of, of racial issues in South Africa and in America, and there is similarities and parallels there. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of things about Americans and South Africans that we have in common. And what gets me is that um, I, one thing I will say about South Africans that you do see not with all Americans, but with certainly a fair number of Americans is that. We have um, interesting sense of humor too. Americans have a kind of interesting sense of humor, and so do South Africans. Um, it's uh, it is fascinating, I think. But anyway, I think I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So, Chris, something that something that you know, I I, I worked and stuff in the states for quite a few years and stuff, mm -hmm. and I have I have literally um, friends of mine in every state. I mean, and good people. Like I have friends of mine in Alabama that I chat to often on, on Facebook messenger and stuff. And it's, they literally are the best people that you'll ever meet. Like I, that, I, I promise you, I can rock up there. If I could teleport right now to their front door in Alabama mm -hmm. and knock on the door, they would welcome me with a cold beer in my hand, like instantly, like just uninvited rock up at their house. And that's, 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 that's Americanism. But I want to about this um, Americanism or Americanization and stuff, um, or the sort of I, uh, the and and you know it's it's a cliche and it might be a little bit tacky, but the idea of the American dream, I do believe that that is a a real sort of tangible, noticeable thing when you do go to America. I believe that you you can notice it, um, but what I've what I've noticed specifically in the U.S is there's a, a hard cultural attack on all these things great about America that sort of, and this is, what, this is why Donald Trump, Donald Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again, worked so well in the US, because I think Americans are starting to notice it. But there's this hard culture in the US, which is, it stems from Marxism, obviously. You know, Marxism, what it wants to do is, what Marxism wants to do, seeks to do is to break everything down and turn it upside down and reform it into something else. Okay, so what what I'm noticing in the U.S. Um, or what I'm seeing on the news and stuff is this hardline effort to break American culture and American traditionalism and stuff, and convert it into something else, something radical, something left, something hard revolutionary and stuff. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think you're kind of spot on here, but it's it's uh, it's an effort to undermine everything, and it's just ludicrous. First off, as a historian, I take great offense to people who want to tear down statues. Why would you tear down the statue of Cecil Rhodes? There would be no Rhodes University were it not for his generosity. Oh, but he got it illicitly. That really isn't the matter. The the Nobel Prize was by Alfred Nobel, who invented gunpowder, and we've seen what that, not gunpowder, but invented dynamite. We've seen what dynamite's done to the world. It's been great for mining, but it's also led to a lot of deaths. Uh, but the irony there, so it really, I find it personally offensive when, when people try to undermine history like this. Listen, there's room for all history and all of our origin story in who we are as a people, whether you're South African American. Uh, what what uh, Shaka did with the expansion of the Zulu Empire was quite brutal and it was unfortunate, but it's South African history. And I think all South Africans should know about Shaka. He was a great king. He achieved immense political power and it was impressive. But he also was a venal and vile and nasty person who killed people in, in a horrible way. Dingani worked with um, worked with um, with um, Pete Retief and agreed with Pete Retief. Um, what is it? Thank you. Um, sorry, I just I was getting a, a time click here. I've got a little bit of time here. So anyway, but um, yeah, so Dingani was uh, was was uh, you know he made agreement with Pete Retief so that the Trek Boers could settle, and then he betrayed him and he murdered all of Pete Retief's party in front of him. But that doesn't diminish what Dingani did as a leader of that group. The Kosa fought nine border wars with the early with the early settlement East European settlers who moved towards the Great Fish River. The Kosa committed atrocities. 
the track or not track but the Europeans committed atrocities too. But that's part of South African history, and people should know about it. And also this denial of things like you know, well, the settlers. Well, you're all settlers except for the Khoi and San. So get the hell out of South Africa. The Bantus have no business being there. You came down the Rift Valley and you settled and colonized and you displaced the Khoi and San. So there's nothing wrong with knowing that history, but there's something wrong with eliminating history. And that's what they're trying to do here in the United States now. The fact that George Washington had slaves is important to know. We should know that he had slaves. It was a different era. We should know also who's responsible for ending slavery. And we should also know how this country is developed and improved over time. There's room for all of this in our origin story. But there's an effort to – if you eliminate all the things that people perceive today as wrong out of context of the historical time that it occurred, how do you know what's right from wrong? How do you know when people do something wrong if you get rid of all that history? It's the most moronic thing on the planet. But it doesn't have anything to do with history. This is an effort to wipe the slate clean and create a, a mind of idiots who are uninformed about history. I mean, like, look, I came out in my video and uh, about Sia Khaleesi on my channel, and I talked about Sia Khaleesi, and people were talking about cutting up the Springboks jerseys. Well, I don't know if you guys saw that video, but um, I did a six-minute video, and I, and I went through it, and I said, this is what Sia Khaleesi said, and I read his comments, and then I commented on it. But it wasn't an attack on Sia Khaleesi. It was, it, was an, it was a commentary on how he's mistaken, how he's not getting the narrative right, and why it's important to get the narrative right. And then I didn't cut my jerseys up because I'm not going to cut up my jerseys. I got a lot of rugby jerseys, especially Springbok jerseys. That's just stupid. You know, I, you know, I, I see a Khaleesi doesn't represent the 2007 Rugby World Cup jersey. And I have the 2011 Rugby World Cup, the 2015 Rugby World Cup. He does represent the 2019, but I'm not going to cut that one up either because my name's on the back of it. My point being is that, is that. This effort to stand, but this is what leftists do throughout time. The Soviets did it. They destroyed the, the Orthodox Church. They destroyed thousands of Orthodox churches and cathedrals, tens of thousands, really? tens of thousands all over Russia to destroy religion. Why? Because they want their religion of leftist nonsense, Soviet nonsense, to be the state religion, even they call it that. And this is what's happening now. People are trying to get rid of the existing order to create an orthodoxy in which you are subservient and owe fealty to these leftists and they're vile and they're disgusting it's like the black lives matter narrative that's running around now it's not about black lives matter what about the three hundred thousand black children aborted every year in this country what about them what what about all the black folks who are killed by black folks in this country uh, you're upset that 208 black americans were killed in police custody last year i get you i'm also upset about them and the 420 white americans who were killed in police custody but guess what? How about circumstances and context? Where were those black Americans killed for the most part? In crime-ridden neighborhoods, in inner cities controlled by leftists in this country for six or seven decades in which they allow lawlessness to occur. There's hope is gone. There's despair. There are fatherless. By the way, 78% of black kids in this country are born out of wedlock. But before people say, oh, you're just focused on black. No, 45% of Hispanic kids are born out of wedlock and 25% of white kids are born out of wedlock. Now, am I some right-wing, died in Christian nut job? No, but the nuclear family with two parents to do parenting together is essential to the healthy welfare and development of children. And that's just the truth. And I, you notice I didn't say they had to be straight or gay. I don't give a crap about that. But my point is that is that they're, look, you look at Black Lives Matter, they want to eliminate um, uh, they want to eliminate Jesus from the church. They they want to eliminate the illegitimacy. And and and, and anyway, it's just. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting on a rant now, but I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, that's fine. You're 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 100 correct there. You know, Chris, I often talk about white white uh, privilege and stuff. And um, I made a I made a video recently about fatherhood because you know myself and Dylan have just recently become fathers, and um, uh. That sounded weird. It sounded like myself and Dylan are married, and we that's no, we're not. No, we we, we don't ask questions. Uh, orientation is your business. No. 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 Yeah, so so anyway, D Dylan did say Dylan did say he lived in the Western Cape, right? Cape Town, yeah, uh, the oh, pink okay. city. <laughs> the pink city. It's called anyway. the pink city for not not called the pink city for nothing, but anyway. So, um, I, I mentioned in this video that, um, I consider as a, you know, I don't have any privilege. I come from a, you know, a, a lower class family, which in Cape Town standards would be considered a poor family. But, um, but my privilege, and I've said this a million times, is my privilege is coming from a family with a mother and a father uh, mm -hmm. who love them, who love each other and are still married to this day. That is the, the ultimate privilege um, is coming from that sort of, 
environment, you know. That's that's no, the, it's 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 absolutely I mean, if you look at you look at the platform, go to Black Lives Matter website, read what they're in favor of, and they're in favor of basically a deconstruction society, no responsibility. And and they're not just about Black Lives Matter, they're about black supremacy. And that's what no one's saying. I'm the only person I've heard say this is that BLM is about now now they have people who support them who aren't in favor of that, but they're about black supremacy. They're about excluding everyone who's not black from conversations and public spaces. And that's what they're about. But no one's calling them out on that. Um, and it, it's really disturbing. It's, it's, it's really heartbreaking. I didn't spend 36 and a half years in uniform defending, supporting defending the Constitution, mostly abroad, 23 years abroad, to come back to America to watch idiots like Barack Obama undermine the social cohesion in this country with his nonsense. Oh, I could have been Trayvon Martin. No, you couldn't. You grew up in privilege, you piece of crap. And you went to elite schools and you had a privileged life. You were handed jobs. You were handed the presidency because Republicans were useless and couldn't stand a candidate up against you. Uh, anyway, so uh, it really breaks my heart. And then Obama goes away. Trump comes in. We see the tensions reduced. We see the wealth gap between black Americans and white Americans and Asian Americans diminish rapidly. Under Trump, we see under Trump the lowest historical unemployment in the history of this country for black Americans since it was recorded. We see under Trump a reach out to the black communities around America through church leaders and civic leaders. And also we see for the first time since the 1990s criminal justice reform, which I oppose, by the way. I wasn't in favor of it, but not on a race basis because I don't believe in letting criminals just go free. But Trump led um, the criminal justice with with Kim, uh, based on Kim Kardashian coming and saying, hey, I'd like you to do this. He did it. And the consequence is that it has a direct impact primarily on the black community because black men are incarcerated at a far, far higher rate because they're in urban centers where they're near crime and they get caught up in it and they get incarcerated, especially with the drug rules with three strikes you're out. So all of these things benefit the black community. And now we're back to like it's 1956 in Selma and people are going to march across the Pettus Bridge. What the hell is going on? It's because these leftists are undermining this country and a narrative and people sit back and ignore it and like it doesn't affect me it does affect you it does affect you yeah that's pretty much why myself Dylan and russell sort of doing this channel and stuff is you know a lot of people are like well you know i'm not really interested in politics or philosophy or anything you know because it doesn't affect me and i'm like that's that's literally that's literally the most untrue thing that you could ever say because politics you know it, it influences you literally directly in in every everything you do you get in your car you drive down the road politics you go to checkers politics you go the price of the food that you pay politics all of that it influences every aspect of your life so yeah it's like they say uh, you might not be interested in ideology but ideology is interested in you well so, ab you know, you gotta... ab absolutely the case <laughs> Yeah, pick up. I just look at South Africa. I mean, so I mean, yeah, there there are there racists in the ANC and the EFF. I'm sure there are. Um, is Juju a racist? Yeah, he probably is. But I honestly think it has less to do with racism and more about his ability to assemble power and bring power. And he's using, you know, this is what happened to Yugoslavia. I mean, you know, the 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 uh, Greek or the the uh, the Serb Orthodox, the Catholics, and the Croats, the Muslims, the Serbs, they all got along by and large for 40 years under Tito. When he died, people thought, oh, it's all going to fall apart. But it kept going because the economy was growing. When the economy stagnated in the late 1980s, suddenly politicians started talking about, well, those Muslims and those Orthodox and those Serbs and those Croats, and people use that to divide people. And this is what the politicians are doing in South Africa. When you see Cyril Ramaphosa go on television and say, it's the nature of whites to be racist, and that's why we have domestic abuse. What? You have domestic abuse in this country in which black men are beating up black women because white people are racist? What the hell is that? It's an effort to demonize a group of others to the profit and benefit politically of someone else. And the ANC is distracting from their abject failure to fix education, to address education in that country, and to treat people fairly and while they've been busy pilfering and bringing everything themselves. And that's what it is. It's all smoke and mirrors. You know, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great and powerful Oz. That's what's happening here. Yeah, so Chris, I yeah. must I must tell you that with that uh, white privilege uh, certificate, that uh, coupon, that um, unlimited white privilege comes exactly the the honor of being blamed for everything. So um, you might you might want to get used to you might want to get used to that now because that's also part of white privilege is you know being blamed for everything. And you're American, you're white, but apartheid. Okay. 
So well, just yeah, that's, saying. That's, right. that's my fault. That's my fault. Uh, yeah, yeah, it yeah. absolutely is. Uh, as is just the fact saying. that uh, for the better part of a thousand years, black Africans in West Africa sold other black Africans into slavery to Arabs uh, in, through, the, through the Sahel, through the Sahara, into North Africa, the Middle East. That's my fault, too, um, even though you know, nothing to do with it. But yeah, there you go. Yes, but, but Chris, but Chris, we all know that it was white people that taught them slavery, okay? So just, you know, just <laughs> own it. All right. Yeah, so of course the problem with that is that the white folks didn't get to that part of Africa till the 15th century when the Portuguese rocked up. Uh, the, anyway, so, but that's that's an inconvenience. No, no, like, no that's, that's, that's not actually true, Chris, because okay. according to Wakanda archives, that the white people actually flew into Wakanda, were flown in via spaceships, and taught them slavery. Okay, so just. Well, that's probably the same technology that we have today that's actually putting a helicopter on Mars. By the way, if you missed my, my stream yesterday, I did the launch of the Perseverance rover, which has a helicopter strapped to the belly. Uh, now, this oh, is man. now speaking of which side, let me just, if I can, because I have to go over here shortly, but but two sure. things really quickly from the There have been a lot of great comments. Thanks for people commenting there, but two things yeah, that jumped yeah. out at me. Toon, Toon said that uh, he was asking about the Spratly Islands. Isn't it a military significant property? Hence, Japan is claiming it. No, uh, the Spratly Islands, that's not what I was talking about, Toon. Uh, those are islands right off the coast of Japan. They're within, you know, I think 30 kilometers of it. The Spratly Islands are in the south in the South China Seas. And the primary parties in concern about the Spratly Islands are the Philippines and China. China is illegally claiming it. They've actually had International Court of Justice ruling against them, and they refused to recognize it like a civilized state would do. Nigeria and Cameroon accepted the International Court of Justice decision of the Bokasi Peninsula. It stayed with Cameroon, even though it's English-speaking and Cameroon is French-speaking. Uh, Botswana and Namibia agreed to the, de the deal with the Sududu Island in the Chobe River, in which it was awarded to Botswana, and they accept the International Court of Justice. But China has refused to accept the International Court of Justice decision on its fictional nine dash line and it's claiming land that's a thousand miles from china which isn't even land so that's the spratly islands and then this is really cool larsola said hashtag silence or science must fall from laughter i like that one. So anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you so much for all our comments and stuff guys uh, sorry we couldn't get uh, get to all of them um it was really a chocker block full uh show full of yeah. really oh really interesting but comments actually packed, um, actually packed. Yeah, so we, we'll we'll probably have to do a um, sort of a dissection um, stream as well, uh, either later on in the week, um, sort of going through everything that we've heard this evening because it's fascinating. Thank you so much, Chris. That's really um, <laughs> like uh, mind blowing stuff. But um, anyway, I think we should we should uh, sort of cut it off here. Um, do you guys have anything else that you want to say? Oh yeah, Chris is on his. Night Owl show that's starting now, right? In, in seven minutes. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about that. My dad. No, 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 no. I, I, it's, I, I'm, 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 I shot myself as well here, so I'm as guilty for the casualties as anyone else. <laughs> Chris has, Chris is Chris has basically been in his YouTube chair for like four hours straight now already. <laughs> 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 anyway, thank you so much for listening, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure to like the video, share our content, subscribe to the channel, and go and check out uh, Colonel Chris Wyatt's channel. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining. We really, really do appreciate it. Um, uh, God bless to you. Um, do you have anything that you want to mention, Chris? Or yeah, no, uh, make sure you send me my certificates. I want that. I want my official African certificate and my white privilege certificate so I can uh, hang it up, I guess, on the wall. But anyway, thanks. No, thanks a lot, guys. Um, I didn't know about your channel, and I didn't realize all you guys were following my channel. Um, uh, Scott, I figured out at some point from his comments, mm -hmm. but thank you for following my channel. Um, it's really growing with gangbusters. I hope your channel takes off, too. Um, uh, you guys have an interesting approach to things. I like the, uh, the format. It's pretty cool. And if you'd like me to be back as a guest, I'm happy to do that. Just let me know. Definitely. Uh, we'll have to come. You'll have to return the favor as well. And we'll have to come on your show as well sometime. Well, I'm having a Zoom session in about six minutes. So if you want to call <laughs> in tonight, you'll be able to call in on Zoom. <laughs> Maybe we will. Cool. Thank you so much for joining, Chris. Uh, and thank you so much if, to all our listeners. Have a lovely evening. Stay reactionary out there, folks, because God, God wills it. God wills it.